expert inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeline of CRM. And today I am delighted to be joined by Diana Boer, who is in Dallas, Texas today. How are you doing, Diana? I'm doing just fine. And Diana, if you don't know her, and I don't know how you would know her, is the author of over 47 books available in 60 foreign languages editions, over 4 million copies sold. And then she's been on every TV show you can imagine. Good Morning America, she's been in the Wall Street Journal. Um, she's uh, received numerous, award, uh, numerous awards. And, um, and so I'm really delighted to talk to her about her latest book, which uh, was released last year, and it's Communicating Like a Leader. So Diana, you've written a lot over the years, as we said, like 47 books. What's different about your latest book and what does, what does communicating like a leader, what, what does that actually mean? Well, actually, I focused on the six, what I call most important skills for any sales leader or really any professional. And I've covered those in previous books on one skill at a time, like presenting, doing sales proposals or, or writing. But I, I picked out the six fundamental skills you have to have as a salesperson and, and picked up the top things or top secrets, I call them, or top strategies in each of those six areas and pull them all together. This is sort of the collection of the best of the best mm -hmm. tips. So uh, do you think, uh, is, is communication one of those skills that you think don't, uh, a lot of people don't innately have and don't maybe recognize that they have to work on? You know, I, that's true. And I think that a lot of people equate communicating as if they were just likability, the likability factor. They get along, they're easy, they're, they're comfortable on their feet, they're affable. And that is not necessarily the same thing as landing a message, as, as walking out with the contract. Those right. are totally different things just because you're comfortable or you're confident, which a lot of salespeople are. Mm -hmm. that, doesn't, that doesn't mean you're always gonna get the deal or get your message across or be persuasive. Those are totally different things. Absolutely. And what do you, will you talk about in, in, in part two, you talk about strategic conversations and that's obviously what you want every salesperson to have with a prospect or a customer is a strategic conversation. So how do you go about creating strategic conversations and being good at doing that? Well, I think what you have to do, first of all, is engage the person. You have to get their attention. And I, the, one of the top things that I hear most frequently pointed out as a weakness when you're selling at the top level. And I think most people do pretty well at engaging and winning trust with a peer, you know, a mid-management person. But when they walk into that C-suite, mm -hmm. nerves take over and they feel a little intimidated. And when I have a senior executive or CEO call and say, we're going to send so-and-so to you for coaching, they need a little quote polish what they see as a major weakness is the ability to think on their feet. That person, and they'll frequently say something to me like this. They'll say, uh, they're brilliant at their job. They really know the product or, you know, they, they really bring in a lot of business. Mm -hmm. But they, and, and when they do a formal presentation, a formal sales presentation, they go through the structured part really well, so mm -hmm. speakly, because, you know, they're prepared for that. But where things fall apart is when they have to think on their feet, <laughs> but when they get questions. And so I think the real mark of an excellent communicator, particularly at that executive level, is the ability to really showcase what they know very succinctly, very clearly, and with authority. That's that's the mark of a master communicator, I think. Yeah. So, so to do that, say in the situation that you're talking about there, where you may have an excellent salesperson, and as you said, can you know operate maybe you know at senior levels, maybe VP level, and then there. I mean, it's happened. I mean, I've had experience in the past, you know, where suddenly the person you're talking to says, "Oh, the CEO wants to talk to you," and it's like a twenty billion dollar company, and you're like, "Okay," and <laughs> but I think part of it is that you have to go in with confidence that you have some value to offer right uh, rather than get defensive or, or get you know nervous so I think that's key to it isn't it that you have to really you have to know something to start with but you have to believe in what you know right and, and the structure is important uh, you want to establish rapport but you establish rapport in a different way when you establish rapport with mid-management people you establish frequently by finding something in common with them right. and having common values but with that senior person, 
everything is just so much faster. And where you establish rapport is by being authoritative, by really knowing your topic and being able to really zoom in on what they want to know more about. And after you've proven that you know what you're talking about and you can express yourself very clearly and very succinctly and you win their confidence, then you can back up and establish rapport on a personal level. But they mm -hmm. want rapport at the expertise level first and then at the personal level. Yeah, and, and I, I that's think that's, different. yeah, and I think that's a fantastic piece of advice for people is the higher up you go in an organization, the more the other person is looking to see, to be honest, whether you're wasting their time or not, or whether you really know what you're talking about. So I think that's a great point is establish expertise rapport first and then personal rapport. Yes, yes. Yeah. And of course, a lot of that they take in within five seconds sure. or seven seconds. <laughs> You know, the body language, the, mm -hmm. the way you look, you dress, your talk, your language, all of that registers immediately. But what comes out of your mouth, the substance mm -hmm. needs to be to establish your expertise. Then then you find things in common and that builds the relationship over long term. And then you become the trusted advisor. But it can't work the opposite. Uh, uh, reverse. Yeah. Reverse. Absolutely. Um, and what about, um, what about the, the, the speaking part of it? Because as a salesperson, right, you know, you, you have to go and, you know, do presentations or increasingly you have to do things like this, right? We're doing over the web. Um, how, is, how can people improve the way that they communicate verbally? I think they have to have a format, a formula, because you're always getting questions just spur of the moment. When you walk in to that C-suite, you always have to expect a dialogue, not a monologue. When, mm -hmm. you're, when you're selling at a lower level, you sometimes get a period where you can uh, know that you're going to have the floor for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Not so at the higher level. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was just speaking in New York last week, last Thursday and Friday, and somebody asked me, they said, I, I have trouble regaining my momentum after I get interrupted. And when I'm at that executive level, they're always stopping to ask questions. And I said, right. <laughs> And they're going to do that continually. Mm -hmm. You want to walk in expecting a dialogue, not that it's going to be one way communication. And so I think it's really important that you understand how to always have a format for putting your thoughts together. When you get asked that off the wall question mm -hmm. that you didn't expect. And when I'm coaching people, I will teach them a format for thinking on their feet. And generally you'll start with a one sentence, overview then you'll elaborate you'll come up with a an, an anecdote to illustrate your point and summarize with the sentence so mm -hmm. just having some kind of format whatever you call it we have an acronym but i drill people over and over asking them just you know wacky questions <laughs> to, to, to mess up their train of thought to see how quickly they can synthesize what they know inherently about their product mm -hmm. their service their offering but answer without getting down in the weeds right. and be very clear and succinct. And how do you help them? Because we've always seen, we've all seen this situation, right? Is that somebody's in the, in, in a meeting, like you're talking about everything's going okay, but then suddenly they, they get asked a question that they don't know the answer to, or don't have a good answer for. And suddenly there is this awkward silence or this struggling to get over and the thing kind of goes downhill from there. How do you help people in a situation like that to, to avoid it going downhill? Well, there are, there are a lot of ways to handle that. In fact, there are probably 15 that, that we teach people. But the easiest way is to, to realize that you're not expected to have all the answers. And in fact, when you, when you walk into an office uh, or to a presentation, in the C-suite, having answers is expected. What you generally should do is walk in with provocative questions. Mm -hmm. When someone asks you a, an, a question that you don't have the answer to, it's fine not to have the answer. In fact, if you can say, you know, I don't really know the answer to that question because, and you probably have a logical reason for not mm -hmm. having the answer to that question, but you can bridge with the transition to say, but your question raises a more provocative question. And that question is, what should we do in the case of such and such? That might be something that would interest our customers about. And if you can spring to a really provocative question, 
that causes that executive to think about something they haven't thought of, opens their mind to a new opportunity, that's creating real value because most people are, they feel put on the spot when they get asked a question, yeah. but you can always relay a question. You can opt to, to someone else, another technical specialist. You can say, you know, I, I don't have that answer, but I can get back to you. I'll have it to you by the end of the day. They don't expect you to have all the answers to all the questions, but they do expect you to bring value by asking questions that they haven't thought of because you read in a broad area, most executives are very, very focused in one industry, in mm -hmm. one, one area, and they don't have time because they have so many avenues and so many things they're juggling. But you bring value by having colleagues in, uh, you know, across the, spread, the span of your network, and you can find answers and bring them questions that they may not have thought of that um, would solve answers to questions your customers have. Mm -hmm that is really bringing um, something to the table that, that other people generally don't. Yeah. So, I mean, I think they, um, in essence, what you're saying here is you can actually use this, not a, or, or treat this not as a, oh my goodness, I'm stumped, but as an opportunity for you yes. to create more value by taking it somewhere else that's going to be intriguing to the, yes. to, yes. this, to this C-level person. Yes. Um, it's just that when you look at like a deer in the headlights, like, yeah. it stumbled you. Uh, stumped you that it's a negative that that can be a negative but if you remain composed and I, I will certainly look that data up for you I'll get back to you on that but here's what that makes me think what it really raises the question about and go right on no problem yeah or even explore say why is that why is that of importance to you yes. so if you want to elaborate a little more on that um, fant um, what about writing? I mean, you have a ch you have a, a chapter or a part here, three chapters on strategic writing. Um, that seems to be something that is, I don't know, more and more becoming less prevalent. I think in terms of people writing well, I think we live in a very casual culture. People are, take shortcuts; they don't proofread what they write. They just send stuff, and they think, well, it's okay. Everything's so casual nowadays. But I always preach to people is no. I mean, unfortunately, today you can stand out by not being casual, actually being thoughtful in your communication. Written. It's extremely important. And I know this answer is going to seem simplistic, but <laughs> but it's it's extremely important. The key is to not tell the reader what the reader already knows. Mm -hmm. you, you would be surprised how many times an executive in a meeting will turn around and say, uh, "Gary, could you get me information on blah blah blah? How much it's going to cost to go to, to exhibit at such as a trade show? We haven't done that in several years. I'd like to know what you think the opportunity is there." And then Gary writes back in an email and says. You asked me several weeks ago to find out the opportunity <laughs> and the executive saying, I know what I asked you to do. <laughs> so don't spend half the screen telling them what they already know or what they already asked you. Just get to the point. Begin with the summary answer or the point. Don't just promise to tell them something if they keep reading. Mm -hmm. Tell them immediately. Be very succinct with an opening statement. And, and I know a lot of people think they do that. They... I try to distinguish between what I call a purpose statement and a message statement. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, I've got in, in the book that you mentioned earlier, Communicate Like a Leader, I have all kinds of examples of where people thought they gave a message statement, and it's really not. It's a purpose statement. It, it's like a prose table of content. It just <laughs> promises to tell. If you keep reading and far enough, you'll have the answer, but it's mm -hmm. not really a message like in the newspaper if you look at the opening mm -hmm. paragraph when it's like in the wall street journal for example the what's news column mm -hmm. and it summarizes the whole story you don't even have to turn over to page 15 right. and a summary of the article that's the way that your opening to the email should start or if you're even writing a proposal if it's a short quote your pricing quote or the overview of what you're going to do for the client that opening paragraph should read like that. It should be a summary of this is the offering and this is the opportunity we're providing for you. Yeah, unfortunately, I think a lot of the times um, people don't reread what they've written and look at it through the lens of the person receiving on the other side and say, actually, you know, would I even get through the first, you know, 20 yeah. paragraphs? <laughs> and even grammar mistakes and poor yeah. documents create an impression. In fact, I was talking to a CEO of, a, of an airline, uh, excuse me, 
not not an airline, a major credit card company. And he mm -hmm. said to people when he was talking to the executives that we had in the session, other vice presidents, and he said, when you make a grammatical mistake to our customers, that means we don't service or amortize your loan appropriately. <laughs> Yeah, that that's the image to our customers. If you're making a mistake in the email, grammatical, they're saying, "Hey, you may you may have messed up the loan <laughs> application or whatever." Yeah. So it's just an impression that you create. Plus, right. many times the whole sentence is messed up, and they don't understand the meaning. Right. Attention to detail. That's that's the issue. And it's like there's no excuse really anymore because you have things like Grammarly that you can use and you know would do it all for you. And, and so so there's no real excuse for it. I just think that some people we've gotten caught up in this casual culture, as I said, and people think it's okay. But that was a fantastic point you just made. If I screw up your email, well, pff, how do you know I didn't screw up your loan? <laughs> Um, and what about meetings then? I mean, meetings is another, is the, the final part of your book. It's about strategic meetings. And, and obviously, uh, salespeople and sales managers, et cetera, you spend a lot of time in meetings. And yeah. how, how effective are, are meetings in general? I mean, I think their effectiveness level is pretty low. Not, they're not very effective. And I think it's because of the lack of leader. Again, that's why I made uh, in the Communicate Like a Leader, that's why I'm one of those whole six sections is learn how to lead a meeting. Think how many meetings you have. And, and part of the point is to calculate your return on the investment. If you just figured everybody's salary sitting in that meeting and multiply you know, times 1.4, which is benefits and salary. Yeah. That's how mm -hmm. many hundreds of dollars you're investing in that meeting. And then think of the output. If it's not, if it's not worth that, then you probably could have just sent out an email and gotten said, give me some input on these three issues and have had the same uh, results or the outcome or the benefit of the meeting for far less cost. But what I try to get across is the importance of an agenda. And you'd be surprised how many meeting leaders come back and say, agenda? <laughs> we don't even have an agenda. You know, they just have a list of topics. Yeah. And that's not an appropriate agenda at all. But just a list of topics. They, they'll go in and to go back to the, what I mentioned earlier about, yeah. uh, should, we, should we go to a trade show? They don't, they don't have that question, which they should have. They'll just have upcoming trade show or employee survey or opportunity with XYZ client. And if you just have that as a topic, that discussion could go in circles for 15 minutes before yeah, yeah. you get to the point. It, it, that, that's not an appropriate uh, an agenda. An agenda really has six parts to it. And if you had an agenda appropriately prepared when you walked into a meeting, then you could do the whole meeting with far better outcome in about a third of the time. So what are, the, what are the six parts to an agenda that you recommend? Well, first of all, the topic. The topic should be in question format. Mm -hmm. Instead of a topic uh, like opportunity with XYZ company, it should say, has, has the CEO agreed to next meeting at XYZ mm -hmm. Corporation? Mm -hmm. Or uh, should we do a site visit to the new nuclear plant in Florida? Mm -hmm. And then immediately when you start that topic, people know what, you're, what the outcome is. Right. And then you have a column on your agenda that tells you the time allocation. Mm -hmm. You might think, well, why is that important? Well, if you're asking so-and-so is going to give you an update, if you've got three minutes there, they know they're not going to put together a slide deck with 60 slides, yeah. you know, if it's a three-minute allocation. Then the next one is, is it for just Q and A? Is mm -hmm. it, it says for discussion, for decision. How many times have you been in a meeting, John, when, you know, you discuss something and you walk out and you think, oh, we didn't come to a decision. That was a total waste of time. But maybe the leader didn't expect to come to a decision. Right. Maybe right. it was just to air the, the ideas to get opinions on something. And he or she was going to make the decision or you were going to defer it to another committee. But people yeah. walked out thinking we failed to make it. <laughs> and yeah. that wasn't the purpose at all. 
Yeah, I, I love that idea because it's that that's such a simple one, but it's such a powerful one. Is the actually um, to um, mark out what the outcome is. If it's just a discussion, great. Then everybody can have a discussion, brainstorm, and say, okay, well, we've got some great ideas for the future. Or if it's a, we need to make a decision. Yeah. So and it's just a little column. It just says for discussion, for decision, discussion on a Q and A, etc. And then you have a place on your agenda for conclusions or recommendations so that when you get through the discussion, somebody is recording as you go along, mm -hmm. what, what was the outcome? What did we decide? Right. Because you know how many times you walk out of a meeting thinking, what did we decide? Yeah, exactly. What, what was the decision? What, what are we going to recommend here? And then you have a column that says who's responsible. If, if there is a next action or an outcome, who's supposed to do it? And then by what date? Mm -hmm. So those are the six categories that you would have walking out of a meeting. Uh, or for your agenda to begin with. Now, the first three are filled in when you start, mm -hmm. and the yeah. other three are filled in during the meeting. And everybody walks out knowing exactly you don't need any minutes mm -hmm. because it's filled out as you go and you know what happened and who's doing what before the next get together. Yeah, and it all boils down to again is to actually doing the prep work in advance rather than just free forming everything, right? Right, right. right. And you, your meetings will be take about a third of the time and they will be far more productive yeah so, uh, well that's another that's another point we could talk about is why does every meeting need to be an hour yeah. <laughs> and they should probably be 20 minutes if, yeah. actually when we do meeting programs we'll have people time we'll give them um, an assignment and what they typically spend 90 minutes on they'll have it done in 20 minutes i mean it's amazing. people just get amazed at how much they can accomplish with this kind of agenda because they know exactly where they're going and with that laser focused question up front it really helps to get to the point quickly yeah. Well, we're bumping up at the end of our time here, Diana. This has been really fascinating. Uh, the book is Communicate Like a Leader. Uh, and it, as I said, it was released um, late last year. Uh, great book. You should check it out. And Diana's other books. And Diana, how else can people find out more about you? My website is boerresearch.com. Just like my name. It's boo her, except I hope they don't. B -O <laughs> boerresearch.com. Well, listen, Diana, this has been fantastic. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine Pipeline of CRM. I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.